I'm Alicia with Chariot Solutions, and I'm here to introduce our speaker, Brian Bergman, presenting strategies for changing prod with no downtime from big bangs to crockpots. And I'm looking forward to seeing how big bangs are related to crockpots. Take it away. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> all right, so let me just uh, I'll start off with a little introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Ryan Bergman. I'm a, uh, I'm a my technical title is senior product engineer, I believe, for uh, at um, John Deere Intelligent Solutions Group. So um, I've been working as a programmer for about 20 years, and um, my interests are in uh, continuous integration and XP practices and computer history and the intersection of fine art and computing. I'm actually originally an art major, so I like to take that aspect of it. But um, enough about me, a little bit about John Deere. If you don't know who John Deere is, uh, we make tractors and construction equipment and lawnmowers and forestry equipment, um, kind of best known for the tractors. Um, <clears throat> we are, I think, um, I believe the largest American manufacturer of agricultural equipment. And we have, you know, a mission to uh, help feed the world as we're, um, you know, coming up, we have a growing population of the earth. Um, we have more people in urban areas. We don't really have a human population problem with this planet. That's kind of a myth. We do have a human distribution problem. So we have a lot of people in urban areas, a lot of people in areas of the world that um, <clears throat> do not have a lot of arable farmland. We have reduced arable farmland due to increasing urban environments and other factors and environmental constraints. And so we need to let the world produce as much food as it needs um, where it needs it. And so that means we have to leverage technology to be able to, um, you know, not just make the American Midwest produce more and more food, but allow the entire world to produce enough food for what it needs. Um, <clears throat> I work specifically for John Deere Intelligent Solutions Group, um, and we are the division of John Deere that works on kind of the more high-tech aspects of the tractors and construction equipment. Uh, we are pseudo headquartered in Urbandale, Iowa. Uh, Moline, Illinois is where the um, headquarters of John Deere are. Um, so we're just down the road. We also have offices in San Francisco and Torrance and Kaiserslautern and Pune. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk a little bit first about what it is that we do at Intelligent Solutions Group and um, the kinds of problems we have and the kind of data that we have to kind of set up the rest of the presentation. And I like, as all good programmers do, puns. And so I like to call this my, my farm to tablet um, <clears throat> talk or one aspect of it. So this, these are going to be a series of, uh, of war stories of how we have um, grown in our uses, usage of data, how we've needed to move those things to the cloud, how we've needed to transform how we're doing things, sometimes multiple times. Um, and so you're going to look back on this, some of this stuff and you're going to be like, but Ryan, why didn't you just do this? And you're right, we should have done that. But so this is a little bit of a retro, and so we'll take the prime directive of regardless of what we discover and understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job they could, given what they knew at the time and their skills and abilities and resources available at the situation at hand. And, of course, the programmer's credo that we did these things, not because they were easy, but because we thought they would be easy. So what, what do we work on here at ISG? Um, one of the, the main things is, uh, is guidance and auto track. So the large equipment does mostly, for the most part, um, drive itself. It's autonomous, um, drives back and forth through the fields. And uh, we do this with satellite receivers that they are largely, well, entirely satellite driven. Um, we have RTK and, um, and base stations to triangulate and provide our equipment with plus or minus one inch accuracy on the planet. So we have an entire division devoted to things like plate tectonics and 
um, being able to ensure that accuracy for all of our equipment. Um, we also maintain the largest, as far as I know, private uh, base station network in the United States and we and in Europe. So our uh, our dealers help us maintain series of base stations for um, for RTK so that we can triangulate and get us that kind of accuracy. Uh, the machines also, in addition to being able to drive themselves, can communicate with each other and be able to um, interact with one another in the field. So this is what we call machine sync, essentially when a couple of John Deere pieces of equipment pull into the same field, they'll form what is effectively a, a um, local WAN party or LAN, LAN party, wireless LAN party. Um, and they are able to communicate their positions to one another. So you see these two pieces of equipment, a combine and a, and a tractor pulling a grain cart. Um, there's someone in the cab of both of those. We always do require someone sit in the cab, but the tractors are, um, equipment's driving itself and unloading that grain. And this is a very stressful operation if you were a human being or two human beings in those two pieces of equipment because those are very expensive pieces of equipment and you could, um, um, you know, could run into each other, you could run over some of the corn, you know, and so um, they maintain the exact correct distance and, um, <clears throat> and are able to, you know, slow down and speed up so that that grain cart is, is filled evenly and we get the most um, usage in there. So we also, during all of these operations, are collecting data. So um, each of the, all the equipment comes with, um, well, all the big equipment comes with telematic enabled devices, which we call an MTG, uh, uh, telematic gateway that is um, cellular. Now cellular networks in, um, in rural America aren't great, uh, you know, despite all of the maps that Verizon and AT&T will show you, I can easily take you not very far outside of Des Moines to places where you really can't get any bars. And so uh, we have um, a lot of strategies for kind of dealing with uh, spotty cellular networks. We will send that data over a string connected by two 10 cans if we could, um, but we do collect a lot of data. So this is our uh, largest planter and it is collecting, it has 32 rows. You can plant 32 rows of crops at once. And uh, we sample that at five Hertz and um, with 15 sensor readings each, which means we're collecting over that CAN bus 24,000 measurements a second. And then we're collecting all of that and we're shooting it up into the cloud where we are consuming it. So that is a lot of data, especially when you consider how many operations are going on at once. And the fact that they tend to go on a lot at the same time. So this is a map of, um, I believe this was from last, last fall and um, just showing each of those dots is a piece of equipment that's sending in data um, and sending in those 12 million records per second. So, um, and they're all kind of going on the same day and that's what happens. It happens in the spring and it happens in the fall. Um, is that we'll have bad weather, everything will be wet, then all of a sudden it'll dry up and literally everybody in Illinois and Iowa and Minnesota and the big, the big um, you know, corn and soybean growing states all get out there at once and, and hit us up. So we go undergo a lot of load. Um, we take that data and we are able to, um, we process it and we turn it into artifacts that the farmers um, can use to help their business. So they will work with agronomists and, um, and equipment dealers and other experts to be able to take a look at their field. What kind of, um, you know, what kind of harvest did they get? How is that related to the planting? Um, and so they can go out and they can take a, a look at a map like this and they can go say, well, what's going on in that, those red areas? So like, why aren't we getting very good yields there? And, um, <clears throat> you know, it might be that it needs, it's too wet, maybe it's too dry, maybe there's um, some pests or something that were happening in that area, but, you know, they don't have to worry about the entire field. They can, they can concentrate on, on different parts of it. 
and then send that same data to an agronomist who can then you know underlie um, merge it with soil data and be able to like oh well you need more lime over here or something um, <clears throat> the data as we structure and store it is in a tiled format um, based on the same tiles that you see when you're on Google Maps and you zoom in and out and you see those boxes kind of uh, pop up and, and down. The, each of those boxes, you know, you start off with the entire earth at level zero, which is just one box, and then you just cut that into four boxes and then down and down and down. And we get down to um, basically a three by three uh, foot sections. So you take this typical field in um, central Illinois, which is 48 acres, which is not that big. Um, it's 40 football fields, 2 billion kernels, um, 1.5 million corn plants stuck on there, divided into three by three little boxes, and which is where we store the data at. And then we can take that data and we can layer it on top of other pieces of data, um, like weather, imagery, um, topography, um, soil data, um, what have you. And you can kind of cut through that and be able to see how did um, how did weather impact? You know, did we get more rain or less rain in this field versus that field? Um, can make a big difference. And all of this happens in, as I said. You know, in the spring and the fall, which is our two main areas, times of year for being busy, you know, there's stuff that happens in the summer. There is some harvesting and then there's spraying operations and such. But um, regardless of whether you're in the northern or southern hemisphere, there is, um, we just flip, you right, the uh, whether you're doing planting or you're doing harvesting. And so this graph shows, you can't see it because some of the numbers are very small. This is last year. Um, and on those peak days, the blue is planting and the, the peaches harvest, we were doing 160,000 operations a day. Um, so you can imagine our infrastructure is re really needs to be able to scale up and down appropriately because we don't want to pay to be running um, servers to manage 160,000 operations a day when most of the days we don't have anywhere near that load. And so all of our stuff is um, highly geared towards auto scaling. Um, and we've done this with numerous different technologies. We'll talk a little bit about them. But um, you know, you can imagine there's, there's one service that I helped write that um, uh, makes maps. All it does is it takes takes in data and it makes a map and it spits the map out. And on Christmas Day, you know, right over here somewhere, on New Year's Day, we're not really doing much, um, which is thankful. We uh, we do all of our high risk stuff on like just after Christmas in January. This is January is our prime time to do anything that's um, that's high risk because um, because there's not really a lot going on. And that service would have maybe not very many people um, accessing it. And maybe that map service is only running like one, or maybe even zero instances because there's no no data for it to work off of. And then when we were at our peak um, over here in, um, in April or May, it might be running like 420 instances was I think the most I've ever seen it run. So it had a lot of work to do during one day when everyone was out planting. Um, and this is increasing for us every year. So this graph shows the number of active um, telematic devices that we have going on every every month. And each of those lines is a different year. So it's just climbing and climbing and climbing as we get more and more um, equipment to be telematically enabled. So I'm going to talk about a couple of different things. Um, the first is a big bang release um, and basically how we moved a central monolith to AWS with only five seconds of wonkiness. We weren't even down. It was just it was just a little bit wonky for like five seconds. So this this monolith um, used to reside in um, in Moline, Illinois. It is kind of essentially 
a very fancy, very big API gateway is what it acts like, except it has a bunch of stuff in it that's um, just a plain old application. And it's what drives all of our public APIs. So we have public APIs for, all, for most of our data. Um, and anyone is able to go to developer.deer.com and create an application and uh, be able to interact with our data and provide um, services and applications for customers. <clears throat> and so this central monolith um, originated in our data center in, uh, in Moline, Illinois. And it's a pretty typical Java Spring Tomcat application. It's got an Oracle database. We had Oracle because that was what was supported at the data center. Um, it's also got a Mongo database. It's got, and then it's got a lot of backend services. So it talks to, in a lot of cases, it's just a front end for other services on the back end. In other cases, it's doing the work itself, but it's got a lot of, a lot of dependencies. And um, it hosts over 1200 individual REST uh, APIs. It's got 7,500 classes, which I counted yesterday, um, 114 downstream dependencies, and and at least within Illinois, uh, it was stuck at seven servers. I mean, we could have requested an eighth server and installed everything there, but each of those servers was, they were virtual, but it was still you had to kind of ask for them, and then there was a little bit of bespoke configuration that needed to happen. Um, but it's a it's a beast of a application. It does front um, service ten billion requests a year, and it handles a lot of large binary files. So it goes through a lot of work, and it uh, puts up with it like a champ. But with only seven servers, we didn't have that ability to scale up and down the way we wanted to. Um, and we also we also were concerned, you know, only having it in. Uh, we had a data center and a backup data center, but both of them were in Moline, Illinois. And, you know, Moline's got major interstate, military arsenal, there's rail lines that handle hazardous waste, there's the Mississippi River, which has a tendency to flood a lot. Um, maybe not the best place that we wanted it to be. Um, so, and then we got, I was on a project to start handling most of this agronomic data and you had to fill out some form. And, um, you know, I was like, oh, I'm gonna need 142 servers because that's the max that we're gonna need and 100 petabytes of, of data. And then we were told, oh no, we gotta, we gotta go, we gotta go somewhere else. So um, we be began the journey of, um, of moving to the cloud and first moving, um, you know, bits of it and more and more started moving out there until, um, but the monolith was kind of stuck, right? It, this, this thing that was fronting all of these other things and those things like had a lot easier time moving because for a lot of them, we hadn't had yet any uh, production usage, but, um, but the monolith is very busy, right? It's central. It's it's um, taking all the requests for all of these things, both internal and external. It's got a transactional database that it talks to constantly. Um, and there was a lot of people who just did not believe that it was going to be possible to move it, not without a serious amount of downtime. People were talking about, well, if we took it down for a weekend, you could get it out there. And we really did not want to do that. We did want to take serious um, the fact that this application was central to the business logic of the company. It was central to the business logic of our partners. And even if we're like at a slow point in January, a couple of days of downtime seemed unacceptable if we could get away with doing it any other way. So we were kind of determined to do that. And this is the story of how we got there. So um, there was a lot of problems building up as we moved more and more of the underlying backend services into AWS. Um, that pipeline, which is a, a, a VPC between the Amazon data centers and, um, and the Moline data centers, 
there's only so much bandwidth in that pipe, right? Um, and it was starting to be very full. Um, it was, you know, even though it's a very large pipe, that's just a lot of data going back and forth. And we were starting to be concerned and we're not the only users of that pipe too. So um, we needed to reduce that. And the best way to reduce that would be to get um, the monolith into Amazon. And, also, obviously, it can auto scale very well. So the first thing we do is we put it out there. We put like the development environment out there, and we just turned it on. We give it like its own instance. It's not that big a deal, and we turn it on and we try to get it to work. And we found that there was a lot of problems. Um, just one, it had a lot of connections to things that were still in Moline. So we've reduced our load on the things that were in Amazon. But there's still all these big dependencies that are that are back in Moline, like LDAP and and other things. And there was a lot of connectivity issues. The firewalls were configured in such a way that it was easy to get from Moline to AWS, but it was a lot harder to get from AWS back into Moline. We had to do a lot of firewall configurations, and we also we had too much stuff going on. So this is a this was like the most invaluable little tool. I wrote like this thing and I could stick it in a Lambda and deploy it into an Amazon account that just like popped open this really ugly UI for me to do Telnet, um, are you there messages through the firewall just to see if I can get to IP addresses um, so that we could get the, the firewalls configured. And, and yes, I do all of my internal support tools in Comic Sans um, with table layouts just because it makes the younger developers really mad. Uh, <clears throat> so our second thing we needed to do um, was after getting our firewalls configured, after reducing some of those dependencies um, on some of the stuff in Amazon, we got that kind of going. And so we, what we wanted to do is we wanted to run the monolith basically multi-region. We wanted it to run in Amazon and in Moline at the same time um, and have each be a replica of the other. And in theory, we could do this with a product that Oracle has called Golden Gate, which promises bi-directional replication, meaning that we could write to either of the Oracles and it would get replicated into the other. And I, when I first heard this, I, I thought, how is that possible? This isn't Mongo. This isn't eventual consistency. This is an ACID relational database with transactions. How could you possibly promise that it can do bi-directional replication? And the fact is, it kind of does. Um, there was also the concern that this was, was going over a really long distance, right? So we're talking about instant. All near instant bi-directional replication going across 880 miles of the United States um, from the Mississippi River to Virginia. And that seemed, that seemed kind of crazy to me. Um, and then we tried to do it and we found that it doesn't really work so hot. Um, it works mostly, it's actually really impressive. Uh, sequences was our big problem. Um, we started this application on older version of Oracle before tables had their own identity columns and you had to have a separate sequence. Um, and Golden Gate did not like having sequences getting generated in, in two different places. Those weren't, those weren't gonna be replicated. So we could only, what we found is we could only write to one of them. So we're like, okay. Well, the replication is actually really good. Um, maybe we can just read, uh, you know, set up a read master or a read primary and um, and a write primary or, or write primary and, and read anywhere and kind of work it that way. The other problem we had was that our Oracle database was really busy. And so it was fine when we were talking about like the testing database because it's not that big. But when you get to the production database, which is quite a lot larger, um, we had kind of a Zeno's paradox problem where we take a snapshot in Moline 
We copy it to AWS, we stand it up, get it loaded in, and then we turn on Golden Gate to try to catch up um, with all of the records that happened in between the time we moved the snapshot. And if you're familiar with Zeno's paradox, this is kind of the tortoise and the hare problem of that the amount of time it was going to take for the replication to catch up was essentially years. Um, even, even though we only had like 25, half an hour of, of, uh, of time in between taking it down, you know, taking a snapshot and standing it up, there was, there was too much. So we had to reduce a lot of that load. There was a lot of tables that were in there that were essentially, um, essentially logging tables, audit tables of um, performance and, um, and other things that were, for whatever reason, at some point got put into Oracle um, because there wasn't a great other place to put them in the Moline data center. So we have a lot more options in AWS. And so we took a lot of those really busy tables and we started feeding them through Firehose into S3, which was fine for them because they're, for the most part, they're write-only logs, they're audit logs. Um, People rarely need to look at them. They're not customer facing. Um, and so we could just put them into S3 and put an Athena query on top of them and, and whatever developer or administrator who needs to go look at those can look at them there. And that alleviated enough of the busyness on the database um, that we were able to um, you know, get Xeno's Paradox down to like about five minutes where we could catch up. So. Um, <clears throat> We decided we, in order to load test and get everything um, satisfactory, that what we were going to turn on in Amazon was equal to what we were running in Moline. Um, we started a process where um, most of the, all the traffic was going into Moline, and then we were taking the traffic, the read operations of the traffic, and replaying them in, Ac in Axiom. So, or uh, in AWS, the applications code name is Axiom, so now you know. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we can't write into Amazon that easily, um, but we did want it to be able to load test via the production load how well um, the AWS monolith was communicating with Oracle for those read operations, because these APIs are like 95% read. Uh, most of the writes come from uh, backend processes and um, you know, that are consuming those telematic messages is coming in through a different pipe and they're not going through the front of this thing. So most of our operations are read. So we kind of took all of that traffic and and put it over and reran it and everything was looking good. So now we get to our um, kind of final setup. So we've got the main DNS and the um, and load balancers like pointed at uh, at Moline. And one nifty thing about the Oracle um, JDBC drivers, which I haven't seen this in, um, you know, some other drivers, I don't recall have them having this feature, maybe they do, um, is that the, you can configure the JDBC driver with both the primary and a backup uh, URL. You don't have to manage that yourself. The driver can do it itself. And so the basically the Oracle driver in Moline was pointed at the Moline Oracle with the Amazon one as a failover and the Amazon one was pointed at the Moline one as its primary and the Oracle and the AWS one as backup. So at this point, we're basically running um, the AWS instance talking to the database in Moline and this works surprisingly well. The system is a little bit slower, probably a lot a bit slower, but it's still acceptable. We can still, you can use it and it's fine. Um, it's not the performance you'd wanna see out of it long-term and it wouldn't be good during peak planting or harvest, but for January, it's good enough. And so, what we did is we set this whole thing up as a failover. So we're going to move to Amazon by basically kicking the legs out of from under the table of the Moline one and letting it fall over into Amazon. And that's kind of what we're going to do on a cold January Saturday night 
when there was a blizzard at eight o'clock we started and what we essentially did was just turned off the oracle database in Moline, or at least we turned off its access. Um, so it's still running. This causes the uh, Oracle driver in Moline to suddenly flip over to the other instance, it's in Amazon. Um, it forces Golden Gate to flip the other way so that it is primarily pushing data from Amazon to Moline as our backup at this point. And the Amazon instance also flips over to using um, its own Oracle. So this is our five seconds of wonkiness. The Oracle drivers are actually really good. Um, I don't necessarily always have the best things to say about Oracle, but I got to say that this part of it um, went pretty smooth. So there was a couple of requests that came in that had errors because of the database, but um, it was then it was then okay. And so we then just basically took our load balancer and we flipped it over so that it's just pointing everything at Amazon. And then we kind of kept it that way for several weeks and then finally tore down um, what was in Moline. And then we were only in Amazon. And that entire exercise, you know, as I said, started at eight o'clock on a Saturday night um, I was back upstairs watching TV with the kids at nine, I think they were watching a movie, um, and had a glass of wine to celebrate. It was that much of a non-event. It started as something that many people, uh, many people who knew a lot about databases were pretty sure wasn't going to be possible, but, um, we managed to pull that off. And today, you know, we've gone from those static seven servers that were in um, in Moline, and we now run uh, we run the application on ECS Fargate, running anywhere between four and twenty five instances, uh, depending upon load. We've gotten our deploy times down from thirty minutes to ten minutes, and we're starting to look at what's next for the application. A big reason we did this was because. Um, going into, uh, you know, we wanted to be able to break up this monolith. Monoliths develop because things are hard to do somewhere else, right? If when you're in a limited data center and it's a big deal to set up applications, then applications tend to get really big because it's easier to just to do stuff there. And so now we can kind of, you know, break that up. I'm not saying microservices, I call them mini liths. Um, you know, we could probably chop it up into five or six different applications that make sense. Um, talking about migrating its database to Aurora and then um, also making it multi-region. So we'd like to store, um, storing the data closer to where it's being used for, um, for different regions of the world. And, and that's kind of its future for that. So um, next we're gonna go into like two kind of semi-related things. So. I, as I was saying in the um, in the monolith talk, one of the things we needed to do was cut our dependencies on the enterprise, um, and so this kind of goes hand in hand with that, and was kind of a um, it was an independent project already, but it got accelerated due to uh, wanting to migrate that. So um, one of the main things I've worked on is kind of the subsystem that keeps track of. Um, users and their relationship to data. So you can have a farmer, a farmer has a relationship with a dealer, you might have a relationship with an agronomist. Um, and these get really, really complicated. Um, we've got 197,000 organizations with 377,000 staff and 173 partnerships. So different organizations partnered with different other organizations for different business reasons. And it gets really complicated really fast. And our current implementation of that was kind of broken up by user type. And so we have, you know, customers and LDAP and we have a RBAC system for dealers and we have partners in another relational database. And so we're having to kind of go through all three of these different repositories and piece together pieces of information about these relationships. And it was very, very difficult um and and additionally neither the the ldap or the rbac were part of our division they were an enterprise thing we had only limited connect 
connectivity to them. We had only limited viewing into what was going on. So when somebody asked me, what's the relationship between these two orgs? It was really hard to answer that question because um, you'd have to go delving into three different things with different tools. And so we wanted to get off of that. We wanted to get off of the dependencies um, in the Moline data center, which these were. And we wanted to get down to a single storage model that could give us the ability to have, um, be able to do very simple, very fast queries of this relationship data, which is essentially a graph. And then the ability to extend it. So we wanted to be able to have employees have accounts like customers without having actual customer accounts. We wanted the ability to support IoT. So to be able to say that a tractor itself has rights to do things. Um, and the old model just wasn't giving us that. So the first swipe at this, and this is where you're going to say, Ryan, that's a terrible idea, um, <clears throat> is we were just going to put it in, in the database. Um, give us just a couple of tables and you know they're kind of structured such that you know we have an org that you're assigned in and a partner org and then there's a set of um, permissions that are tied to those in in another table um, and so we wrote this migrator process to try to get us over into the new structure and it mostly worked and it's actually pretty seamless. And we were running kind of, um, uh, you know, while everyone's using the system, we can get slowly migrate this, this stuff over um, into our new structure. But then what we found was that uh, by the time we got to actually doing it was that it really did not like the structure we had, this separate permissions table that had the permission row to a set of individual roles or permissions um, it was getting way too big. It was in the hundreds of millions of rows and the indexes weren't happy. The database wasn't happy. Um, and we were getting to a point where we simply couldn't insert at the rate that we needed to. And again, we get into like the Zeno's paradox of, well, if we slow it down, it's, it's going to take us months to get the data into the proper structure. So we need to re-examine how the structure is and how we're populating it. And part of the problem was that when we did the design and looked at the projections, um, we were projecting a much lower population growth than what actually happened. Um, and so then by the time we got to it, um, we had much higher. We should have, in hindsight, you know, really thought more about that. And well, what if the growth was five or six times what we think it's going to be? And we could have seen that that project, that problem was going to happen, but uh, we didn't. We didn't until the end. Luckily, um, we kind of went in a two-step process. There was kind of a um, a large part of the tables growth was due to what we call partner assignment, And we kind of figured out a short term way to kind of cheat that we weren't happy with it, but it allows least let us get off of the enterprise stuff and into a set of data that we could work with and then do what we call we ended up terming a crockpot migration. Um, <clears throat> So we kind of targeted for our final design for how this was going to work. And we we're just going to flatten that table. We we're just going to denormalize it. And it's optimized for writing or optimized for reading. We didn't really care. Writing can be slow, um, but it gives us having that in basically a flat graph um, allows us to do a lot of queries we wanted to do really, really fast and really easy to figure out who has what rights and what. And to be able to say, you know, hey, give me all of Sally's organizations where she can um, manage equipment. That can be done, done really, really fast. Um, and we could place a nice GraphQL on top of it and it would be really slick. So we decided, we, we, we kind of did all the projection. We said, yeah, this is very, very manageable. This will be great for our data. But we needed to migrate these 880 million rows of data um, to get into this new structure and populate that. And so if you're not familiar with what a crock pot is, um, <clears throat> it's a slow cooker. And um, you know, I would use like barbecue or smoking as an analogy, but we don't really have a long, his strong history of that in Iowa. You have to go down to Kansas City for good barbecue. Um, we have 
crock pots, which have a tendency to just kind of make everything taste the same. But um, but they're exactly what we want to do. You take a bunch of food, you throw them in there, you turn them on at noon, and then by dinner you have you have what you want. So we want to be able to manage this data without stressing things out, without stressing out databases, without stressing out indexes, and without stressing out humans. Um, we don't want a bunch of people like sitting around watching, um, you know, monitors trying to figure out how fast we can push it. We just want to put it in and not worry about it, let it go until it's done. And then remember to unplug your crock pot at the end of the day, even if you turn it off. Um, <clears throat> so we developed these slow running background processes that slowly transform the data the way that, um, the way that we want it to. Um, and allows them to be unattended. And if it takes two weeks to do, we're cool with that. Um, <clears throat> we set up some transformers on the front end directly from the web application such that if we had some partner organizations that wanted to opt into these um, situations or we wanted to opt them in so we could observe the behavior, then we could get those um, high priority ones in first. And then the crock pot just kind of sat on the background doing its thing. And as we're interacting with the system, um, you know, we can easily detect, are we on the new model or are we on the old model? And then we can split the traffic to go down either pipe. And then eventually after everything's migrated and everyone's happy, um, we get rid of the old model and then we're only on the new model. Um, <laughs> And that worked perfectly for that project. We were able to get the structure into the, into the um, shape that we wanted it to be. And we've been using that same pattern for, um, for a number of different things. We kind of keep coming back to it. And so we're gonna take that same idea and we're gonna apply it to even much larger data. And that's the last part of this presentation. So we, the agronomic data that comes off of the equipment, we used to have a desktop application. We still do have a desktop application. It was written back in Windows XP time. Um, you know, I think it's base minimum requirement is a Pentium 4. So that tells you how old it is. Um, and with it, you could look at, your agro at the agronomic data that came off of your equipment and you could look at maps and, and such. And we wanted to move that to the web. We didn't want to keep supporting a desktop application. Um, you know, it's hard to get updates out. We wanted to be able to do a lot of things to allow partner organizations to be able to look at large sets of data. Um, and there's a lot of other desktop applications that are in the same grouping and we weren't very differentiated from them. So having access to more data at once across lots of different things um, would allow us to do more of the things we want to do. And so our goal is to, at first, well, we need to get Apex off of the desktop and onto the web, which is a common story. So the first stab at it, and this is when I came in on this project, um, was to literally take the desktop application and chop it up and make it work on, on the internet. And it kind of looked like this in some ways, because we literally like it's a C. Sh Luckily, it was written in C sharp, um, and not something worse, I suppose. Um, but we're able to restructure some of that code, take the same data that's coming in, process it with the same things that we're producing maps for the desktop application, and we can essentially create. Hey, here it is. Here is here is Apex on the web. And it worked. Um, we made a, a web app out of the artifacts, and but it has some bad points. It wasn't particularly fast. Um, it needed a lot of resources because this was code that was not particularly designed to be running on a lot of different pieces of data at once. And it was kind of used to having the CPU all to itself. And um, it was kind of single threaded. And so it was not designed for high volume, massive amounts of data. And the, pro the products that it, and artifacts that are produced were pretty single use. We couldn't really, you know, we wound up with this map um, that was really only good for that map. And we weren't able to do better things with the data. And remember, we want to, we want to be able to 
layer all kinds of different things over over that data. So we came up with a um, a new thing, and this is basically like the world's biggest crock pot, except it's it's more like a pressure cooker. Um, and we kind of broke it into four distinct steps. So the data that comes off of the combines and the tractors and such is very dense binary format. Um, and so we have a step that basically takes that and just consumes it. So we're getting it from streaming data off of MTGs and we're getting it off of people uploading it over um, a web form and we're getting it as backups from Apex. And so we get that raw, that raw data. And then we take that and the next step takes it and puts that into a standard model. And we have an open source uh, model for agronomic data that we largely use. Um, and we get no matter where that data comes from into the same consistent model. And that's, but it's still the raw data. And then we go to the next step, which is called enhance, where we take that data and we start to decorate it with all kinds of things. So for example, we the equipment does not have how many miles per hour you are going as one of the pieces of data that comes in or kilometers per hour. Um, what we do have is we know your GPS location when you are at this point in time and this point in time. And so we can calculate um, speed from that. And so that's an example of one of the many things that we enhance on all the data. And then it goes to a final step, which is where it takes all of this rich data that we've, um, that we've calculated and it produces these gridded um, data artifacts that are able to be presented within app web applications or mobile applications um, to, show you, to show you the data. And so we started this off with basically two paths. The first is, you know, the ingested model part are pretty much the same. Um, and we've got it into um, a form of our open source adapt document. Um, and then half of it goes to the old model and goes through those older applications um, and gets processed, which had been optimized, but they're still producing, uh, you know, pretty much single use stuff. And the other half is going through our new enhance and transform steps to give us a model that is more reusable and we can layer with other pieces of data. And so this entire time, both of these systems also have separate front ends because the APIs they're using are completely different, but we need to make them look and act mostly the same or at least have the same results. So if one says that you got 150 bushels per acre, the other one better say that you got 150 bushels per acre because there's nothing people hate more than two things telling you you have different bushels per acre. Um, <clears throat> the older systems, again, we're using a lot of those single use um, C sharp services from a, from a kind of an infrastructure standpoint, um, communicating with each other over queues, a lot of the storages in Mongo, the new stuff. And this, when we started this was about five or six years ago when Scala was kind of hot for a while. So a lot of them are written in Scala, um, going through Kinesis. If you're not familiar with Kinesis, it's similar to Kafka. Um, so they're kind of streaming queues um, and then storage going into Dynamo and S3. And, um, and this is kind of what, what they look like. So we have these two, you can see they're pretty much, they're pretty much exactly the same. They should be exactly the same. They're a little bit out of, a, there's some visual differences, but we're, um, we're generally, and we have a lot of testing that has to make sure that, you know, one path doesn't produce a solution that's different than the other path. As far as the, the other half goes, the new stuff, is we've had to um, kind of redo it multiple times. So the first time it's these Scala services writing through Kinesis with Dynamo. Um, and then we swapped out Kinesis for Firehose and Spark and S3. And then we completely redid that again and went to Kinesis with Flink and Aurora um, and my, we have another presentation that gets 
into the more details about this that a friend of mine does that's pretty interesting because he was in the the guts of this i was sitting at the table next to him and only chiming in when i had something you know something to say about it that probably wasn't helpful um the final solution that we're at right now is still mostly scala kinesis ecs and um and elastic um, and we're even seeing now actually most of the teams if they're going to severely rewrite one of the parts of this um, most of them are going off of Scala and moving back to Java um, it's difficult to hire for Scala and honestly modern Java it's it's fine um, I think most of our Scala stuff tended to be more object oriented than functional anyway so um, we weren't really buying all that much with it um, I'm an old Java person myself, so I was fine with that. So within this, we're really balancing, um, making it fast by pre-calculating and having many petabytes of data. And we're talking, you know, at the biggest one where we were kind of going to optimize the most for uh, for pre-calculated artifacts is we were somewhere around. Um, 20 or 30 petabytes and we only had a fraction of our customers data in it and it so the the storage costs were going to be astronomical so that one had to had to go um, but it's either you can make it really really fast and have a lot of pre-generated artifacts so you're paying for more storage or you can kind of optimize for storage but that means you're going to have to do more on the fly calculations um, as the data is coming out, in which case it makes it slow. So each of those, you know, each of those iterations is an attempt to balance one of those two things. And it's a pendulum going back and forth and back and forth. And each time we wound up with a process that migrated from one data structure to the next data structure. Um, and for a lot of those, you know, we were in kind of a beta phase and we only had a limited number of customers. So we didn't have to worry about everybody because most people are going to that old original system and they were happy with that. And now we're at the point where we're really about ready to, um, to release this to everybody. I believe within, within the next year, we should be. Um, <clears throat> And we can start to be a lot smarter about things and start to introduce, um, I don't even know if I'd call it machine learning or anything like that. I don't think it's even that fancy. It's just making some smart decisions about, look, you've got a farmer's uh, 10, 15 years worth of data. Are they gonna look at maps from 2009? No, they're not. We know they're not gonna look at them. They don't need to be that fast. So we can optimize for what's going on right now. You know, what's going on between you generally, if you're a farmer, you're interested in the difference between this year and last year, maybe at most two years back. Um, and we can optimize for that. And then we can make the stuff that's older, um, a little bit less of a priority and a little more compressed um, because it's unlikely that they're going to look at it a lot unless they're bored one day. In which case, you know, taking an, a couple of additional, uh, you know, an additional five seconds to say, hey, we're getting your older data ready. Most people are, are fine with that. They want the new stuff, the stuff that's coming in today to be almost instantaneous. Um, but that's, that's that pendulum of going back and forth. And we're talking about, you know, differences in costs of tens of millions of dollars. Um, so it's a big deal, especially for a product that we don't charge for. So that's my presentation. Um, thank you very much for coming. And I'd, uh, you know, willing to answer some questions or hang out on Slack afterwards and um, let me know. Thank you, Ryan. That was great. Uh, I love migration stories. So we do have a couple of questions. Uh, what is the logic that triggers auto scaling? Uh, so it's it depends on the application. A lot of the backend processes that are doing um, dealing with the agronomic data, it's based on Q depth or um, or a similar metric. If you're talking about kinesis, which is not is kind of a Q and kind of isn't, um, so it's mostly Q depth for those things. For 
um, the big monolith REST API, it is based on a metric um, of, of outstanding requests. So not like total number of requests or anything like that, but how many threads is the monolith using right now? Because that's really our bottleneck is the number of database connections that it can make um, per instance. And so, and, and actually, so we devised an entire thing to calculate outstanding. And then I believe Amazon has in their newest version of Elastic Load Balancer, basically the exact same thing that we had worked on figuring out. So I believe we've switched to Amazon's metric for outstanding. Thanks. And uh, talking about those boxes, the boxes and the layers. Yeah. Do, do those take into account wind, for example? Uh, well, so weather is one of them and we collect, we can collect and source weather from any number of, um, there's a lot of people who are basically collecting weather data for this kind of stuff. Um, I don't know that wind is, we're, we're much more concerned with um, rain, with what, you know, how much rain you've gotten. That's kind of the primary thing people are interested in. But wind does come into account when we're talking about crop damage and um, crop insurance. And I don't know how many people were um, plugged into this, but last summer, Iowa experienced a derecho, which is essentially like a land hurricane. Like it's 80 mile per hour sustained winds. Um, there's a huge 150 foot, at least tree in my neighbor's yard that was completely topped over and fell in my driveway. It fell right, right in between our houses. Um, there was massive amounts of crop damage for that. And you could actually go into our systems and look at the, you know, we could pull in some of that data and you could see exactly where those derecho winds just decimated a lot of a lot of farmland um, and urban areas too. It was it was pretty bad. I did hear about it. I think that's the first time a lot of people had ever heard that word uh, and how to pronounce it. Yeah, everyone in Iowa learned how to pronounce it. It was it was all our first time too. And then it was all anybody could talk about for for a few weeks. I even lost uh, you know, huge parts of the city lost power for weeks. Um, I got mine back that day, but the all of the cell towers were knocked out. So we had no internet, cable was out, and I, you couldn't get anything on your phone. I would have to drive like to a, a mall parking lot with my laptop in order to uh, to get any connection. Okay, I think I think that's it for the questions and we're just about time as well. Cool. So I just wanna say thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, and thank you for answering questions. Yep, glad to be here. Okay, everyone have a great afternoon. We have more talks tomorrow uh, and recordings will be posted. Thanks everyone.